welcome back to the class uh, we are continuing with the discussion on uh, ml del cream and in the previous class we had an elaborate discussion on uh, his uh, methodological arguments his uh, book the rules of uh, sociological method which he uh, wrote basically to uh, reinforce his claim that sociology really represents a new discipline and that book really played a significant role in the institutionalization of the discipline or or even the professionalization of the discipline we discussed that book in detail his preoccupation with the idea of the social the way he argued that uh, sociology studies social facts and the features of social facts and uh, all the related uh, topics so in today's class as well as the next class uh, we will be discussing uh, his one of the most important works of Emil Durkheim, that is the division of labor. In fact, it was his uh, doctoral uh, research, uh, which was published in uh, 1893. So this is considered to be one of the most important uh, works of, uh, em of, of Emil Durkheim, because uh, this work contains quite a lot of uh, important concepts, important theoretical arguments about the nature of society, his understanding about the, so about the society, about the transition, about the transformation of social of societies, the larger question of social change, and also a host of uh, other very very important uh, uh, theoretical conceptions of of uh, uh, Emil King about morality, about uh, you know collective conscience, about a host of uh, about punishment, about law, about education, and a host of other uh, things. So so this book is something very very uh, important. So, um, yeah, so it's a, his a first major work which was published version of his uh, French uh, doctoral thesis, The Division of Labour in Society. So in this work, he actually looks, uh, looking to the past to interpret the present. That's what that came actually does in his uh, work. He makes a distinction between societies characterized a, a kind of a new society and old society. Okay, and he does not use this term, rather he uses a very fascinating concept called as uh, the question of uh, social solidarity and we will discuss that in this particular lecture. So on the basis of this social solidarity, he uh, distinguishes between two types of society. One is the kind of a modern society as uh, that was existing during the King's time, a modern European industrialized society and the other one is the, is the more primitive, the older forms of uh, society. So he wanted to compare or he wanted to contrast these two types of societies and then try to understand what are the fundamental differences between these two types of societies. So the game examines the unique features of the modern society by comparing it uh, to the pre-modern world of a distant era. Then he examines the shifting basis of social solidarity as societies evolve from an undifferentiated and simple profile to a complex and differentiated one. So we have seen uh, that uh, this whole question of social change was a major theoretical preoccupation uh, for almost every social uh, scientist or every historian or sociologist or even philosophers of this particular time and most of them adhere to a conception of a unilinear evolutionary model where uh, societies from a very simple, uh, undifferentiated uh, state of uh, being transforms into a more complicated and differentiated set of, of, of uh, uh, existence. And uh, they, they call the previous uh, form as primitive and the present uh, society as modern. So Delkheim also has something similar to that, a similar kind of a schema uh, about social change. But he brings in a very important concept, a very important, a very significant concept. And this concept is what we understand as social solidarity. Okay? As social solidarity, as societies evolve from an undifferentiated and simple profile. An undifferentiated, we understand it, it as something simple, something similar. So homogeneity becomes the, the, the character of that particular society. Everybody uh, uh, is similar. There are a lot of similarity within that particular society in terms of what people do, what people uh, uh, work, what kind of uh, belief system that people have, what kind of occupation that people have, what kind of ideologies that people have. So there will be some, there will be, there will be major, uh, you know, form of similarity or of homogeneity 
when it exists when you talk about this and differentiated and simple societies to a more complex and differentiated society. So he uh, brings in a number of important concepts which we will discuss one by one in this uh, particular class. He talks about social solidarity, about collective conscience and I have used this term collective conscience here but I have also used the term collective consciousness in the previous uh, uh, class when we discussed about uh, uh, rules of sociological method and these two terms are used interchangeably. The collective conscience, uh, social morphology, mechanical and organic solidarity, social change, social functions and social pathology. So these are the major themes that he discusses uh, in this particular work. So now coming to this idea of social solidarity. What does social solidarity mean? Now, what do we mean by this term solidarity? Uh, a, a sense of feeling uh, together, isn't it? A sense of identification. Uh, when, you, when you study in a particular class, you feel a sense of solidarity with that particular class. Uh, especially when there is inter-class competition, whether it is sports or games or, or cultural activities, there is enormous amount of competition between different class and every every student of the class usually feels a sense of 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 we feeling a sense of belongingness a sense of loyalty to that particular class and Durkheim uses this term solidarity almost in the similar uh, uh, sense so uh, he's asking this very very profound question how are individuals made to feel a part of larger social collective when you're talking about large societies okay this question is pertinent for both the, the, the simple societies very very small societies uh, like that of a, of, a, of a primitive tribal societies even and, and compare that with that of a much larger society where you have you know millions of people millions of people becoming uh, members of the society you will you can ask this fundamental question how are individuals made to feel a part of this larger social collective what are the mechanisms through which each and every individual feels that they are part of this larger society? Because he asked this question because how are their desires and wants, constraints in ways that allow them to participate in the collective? Because we know that uh, every individual, their needs are limitless, their desires are limitless, they are quite different in terms of their orientation, their ideas, their wants. But somehow, there is some mechanism through which we have been trained to uh, have a check on our desires and our, our needs and we are kind of, 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 of trained to live in a, in a more or less amicable uh, kind of a situation. So we have, I have mentioned in the previous class that uh, the game was heavily preoccupied with the whole question of social equilibrium or social order or social stability. Okay? So how is that a society is able to function without so much of conflict or so much of violence and and the claims of focus was always on the question of this equilibrium or social order or social stability okay. social uh, he he understood social conflict as something something abnormal as something unwelcome something that needs to be resolved at the earliest thing so this was one of his fundamental question okay. what makes them how that human beings are able to participate in the collective how are the activities of individuals and other social units coordinated and adjusted to one another. Okay. So, uh, especially in, in, in complicated societies, in modern societies, you have so many different uh, uh, you know, types of activities are being carried out. And how are they coordinated? How are they adjusted to one another? And in order to explain that, he brings in this term, this collective conscience to elaborate that. Okay. Collective conscience or collective consciousness. He was concerned so before uh, elaborating this he was concerned with the system of symbols particularly the norms values and beliefs that human beings create and use to organize their activity so we discussed in the previous class that the came was very particular that he wants to understand society as an empirical reality as a thing it, it, it is sui generic so he argued that sociology as a distinct social science has this uh, distinct or exclusive subject matter, the social as its as its as its uh, you know realm of enquiry. So he believed that the system of symbols, which becomes a part of our culture, it constitutes a very important uh, realm of enquiry. And he believed very strongly that 
uh, and a scientific study is required to understand the role of these symbols, the system of symbols, particularly norms, values and beliefs and to understand the way in which these belief systems influence individuals both personally as well as collectively. Okay? And this is something very important both collectively as well as personally. So he comes to this whole uh, question of moral uh, facts. Moral facts are phenomena like others. They consist of rules of action recognizable by certain distinctive characteristics. It must then be possible to observe them, describe them, classify them and look at look for laws explaining them. Okay? It's a very very powerful uh, argument. So just like you have material things, okay? just like you have very concrete uh, you know data available outside or just like for a for a for a physical scientist or a natural scientist there is data available for him to uh, explore he argued that for a sociologist as well these uh, you know symbolic systems which uh, they consist of rules of action recognizable by certain distinct characteristics uh, and and they are more facts this, this cultural uh, domain about norms, values and other things, they are phenomena like others and if they are phenomena like others and if they are something extremely important, if they are consequential, okay, if they have so much of ability to influence the individual as well as the collective life of individuals, then it you must be able to observe them, describe them, classify them and look for laws explained. And I hope you understand that by this four categories observe describe classify and look for laws he is talking about the about the scientific scientific methodology okay he is talking about the scientific methodology so he is arguing that you are able to study the value systems in a scientific manner so he then goes on to define uh, collective conscience as the totality of beliefs and sentiments common to average citizens of the same society forms a determinate system which has its own life. One may call it as the collective or common conscience. Okay. The totality of beliefs and sentiments common to average citizens of a same society forms a determinate system which has its own life. So here uh, I, 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 I bring your attention back to uh, the, our, our discussion on social factors today. So we uh, discussed that it is general, social fact is general, uh, it has coercive uh, you know, uh, ability and it is external to an individual. Okay? So similarly, when he talks about collective conscience, he is saying that the sum total of beliefs, okay, the sum total of beliefs and sentiments which are held together by the members of the particular society and this particular conscience, uh, if it has a determinate character. It, it, it determinate system which has its own life so it needs to be studied on its own right and one may call it a collective or common conscience so it is a sum total of all the uh, all the all, all the beliefs uh, systems uh, held together by all the people but it is definitely more than an individual conscience okay? so that is a kind of very very interesting uh, argument that that can brings in why it is constituted why it is created by each and every individual, once it, it gets formed, it is much more than that. It is an extra, extremely important example of a social fact. So it has an independent reality of its own. People born into a culture internalize uh, it more or less uniformly. So uh, whether, uh, if, you, if you remember our discussion about social fact, whether it's about uh, religion or about how to get married or how to, uh, you know, conduct the death ceremony of a, of a death, that person or how to celebrate, how to uh, express anger, how to express joy or, uh, or, or a host of other, other, other uh, systems of practices and beliefs are already there in a society and the person is born into that and, and a person gradually understands this process through the process of socialization. So that aspect of culture, the system of values, beliefs and norms constrain the thoughts and actions of individuals. We have discussed uh, it uh, sufficiently uh, in the previous uh, class. So there are four important uh, you know, variables of uh, collective conscience according to Berkman and they are extremely important. One is, he calls it as the volume, uh, the degree 
to which the values, beliefs, and rules of the collective conscience are shared by members of a society. Okay. So, what is the overall amount of these, uh, you know, common values or beliefs and rules which are shared by people? Can we very categorically say that uh, everybody of the particular society believes in that, or or the volume of this collective conscience is too high? that it does not leave out anybody. There is virtually no person who is not a part of collective functions. Or can we say that this volume is not very high, it is very thin, it is very less, there are a lot of other people in the society who do not believe in that. So this is one of the questions. And the second one is its intensity. Okay, The extent to which collective functions has the ability to guide and influence the actions of people. You know that the mere existence of collective functions is not sufficient. We need to understand to what extent they are powerful. Okay. Are they really powerful enough to enough to shape the thinking and actions of individuals? Okay. Are they really uh, powerful so that uh, everybody abides uh, by that? Everybody abides by this by this collective conscience. And third one is determinateness. Okay. It denotes a degree of clarity in the components of the collective conscience. Whether is there any uh, any confusion about what does a particular norm mean, or about what about a particular value mean, or is there any is there any 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 lack of is there any ambiguity about it, or this this particular values and and the ideas are they completely uh, you know completely uh, are they are they are they highly clear, or is there ambiguity about it, and the fourth one. The religious versus secular kind of extremely important one. What is the what is the uh, ratio of religious to purely secular symbolism in the collective conscience? What is the influence of religion in these value systems, in these norms, in these cultural practices? Is the is, are, are these cultural values are are heavily you know uh, influenced by religious component? Are they theologically loaded? Or are they secular? For example, a, a host of questions. For example, the question of getting married. Is the marriage seen as a mere contract between uh, two uh, adults, building adults? Or is marriage seen as a sacrament? Or what is about maybe about uh, abortion? How is abortion seen in a society? Is it seen as a sin? Or is abortion is seen as, as, as an unwelcome one, is it seen as a sin? Or is it seen as a purely medical procedure, bereft of any, any, any religious uh, ideas? So a host of similar kind of questions, so to what extent they have this religious or secular content in these in this, uh, value systems, in these cultural domains is something very important. So one is the volume. The, 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 the degree to which uh, they are they exist. Second one is intensity, how powerful they are. Okay. Can people get away without uh, you know observing this collective conscience? Or uh, is it such a scenario that people can't think of you know disobeying them? They can't even even think of disobeying. Or what is the kind of a determinateness? And fourth one is the religious or secular content. And then the came moves on uh, to uh, the Maybe you know the, the, the best example in order to understand these things would be to uh, take two crude examples of one a very a primitive society, a tribal society, and then second one that of an industrial or uh, you know advanced urban society. And then you will see that uh, each of these four variables are very different in each of these uh, uh, societies. So Dakin introduces this uh, idea of social uh, morphology. So, uh, Dakin saw social structure and he calls it as morphology as involving an assessment of the nature, the number, arrangements and interrelations among parts, whether these parts are individuals or corporate units such as groups and organizations. So, Dakin belongs to this uh, uh, theoretical group called as structural functionalism and they have a particular preoccupation with this whole idea of structure. So he, uh, in, uh, he understands social structure as an assessment uh, involving an assessment of the nature, number, arrangement and interrelations among parts and whether these parts are individuals or corporate units such as groups and organizations. 
he attempted to demonstrate the connection between social morphology and collective conscience in different societies. So here he is making a connection between the social conscience on one side and the kind of social structure on the other. So he is trying to bring a theory, he is trying to argue out with a theory that there is a connection between this collective conscience and the social structure or social morphology or social structure social morphology and he argues that the collective conscience uh, of primitive societies and collective conscience of advanced societies are quite different because there is a particular relation between the social structure and the collective conscience. So in order to uh, bring in the connection between collective conscience and social morphology or social structure, he uh, brings in two, he introduces two uh, terms that is mechanical and mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity and uh, the, the, the basic aim of the claim uh, you know, is, is to explain the kind of social change by bringing in the connection between uh, collective conscience and the social morphology. So he's talking about two types of uh, solidarity, this sense of we feeling or the sense of uh, feeling attached to a, a collective set of ideals and he talks about mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity. So typology of society is based on their modes of integration or solidarity. So it's a typology based on their modes of integration. What is the, what, 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 what kind of integration that they have? What are the kind of mechanisms of this integration uh, for an individual with that of a society? So this distinction is both a descriptive typology of traditional and modern societies and a theoretical statement about the changing forms of social integration that emerge with increasing differentiation of social structure. So uh, it, it, is, it is both, it is a, uh, a, a, a descriptive typology because he uh, describes what are the features of societies characterized by mechanical solidarity and he also describes what are the features uh, of societies characterized by organic solidarity. And also it is uh, a theoretical statement about the changing forms of social integration. Okay? So as I told you that, that his, his fundamental uh, objective is to explain social change. So it is a typology on the one hand and it is also a theoretical explanation about social change uh, that takes place when society moves from a, uh, a mechanical solidarity to that of an organic solidarity. So uh, he defines mechanical solidarity thus. Society is characterized mechanical solidarity and described as segmentary, unorganized or amorphous. Exhibits only rudimentary differentiation meaning very little specialization of roles and functions. People occupy similar social positions, participate in similar social activities, perform similar economic tasks and live similar lives. So essentially uh, he is talking about uh, societies characterized mechanical solidarities uh, as simple societies and the best example could be that of a, a tribal society, a, a primitive society or a, or a, or a very uh, basic agrarian society. Agrarian society may not be a good example but a primitive tribal society would be a, would be, would be a more uh, acceptable example because uh, it is seen as segmentary, it is seen as unorganized, it is seen as amorphous and exhibits only rudimentary differentiation. There is not so much of differentiation in terms of what people do. Very little specialization of roles and function. And we know that in tribal societies almost everybody does uh, the similar kind of works. And there could be very, very, very vague kind of division of labor based on maybe on, on age or gender. But otherwise uh, everybody does uh, almost a similar kind of work. People occupy similar positions. Social stratification would be very less. Participate, participate in similar social activities, uh, you know, the, the, for example, the, the worship pattern of a uh, religiosity, uh, expression of religiosity of a tribal society would be same. Everybody does uh, it, it in the same way. You will not have different arguments about it. You will not have different worshipping patterns. You don't have different theology. And perform similar economic tasks and live a similar lives. Almost everybody lives a similar kind of life. And this type of 
This social type is formed through replication, yielding a collection of largely identical and interchangeable individuals, each capable of subsisting independent of the other. And you know, uh, many of these type of societies have been characterized as unchanging because they 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 uh, uh, continue the similar kind of lifestyle for the past several centuries. Okay, so they reproduce through replication without bringing in so much of. Uh, changes, especially if these tribal societies are kind of cut off from the other uh, civilizations or if they are isolated. And uh, they yield a collection of largely identical and interchangeable individuals, each capable of subsisting independent of the other. Everybody knows hunting, everybody knows cooking, everybody can uh, lead or everybody does lead a kind of a similar life. In its most elementary form, a secondary society consists of an absolutely homogeneous mass of indistinguishable parts. And this is how he characterizes a simple society characterized by mechanical solidarity. An absolutely homogeneous mass, a similar kind of people of an indistinguishable parts. The social structure of such a society would be extremely less because you don't have so much of division of labor, you don't have too many parts of the particular a society social system would be would be very simple and in that sense it's a uh, it, it's a very homogeneous society and uh, when you look at the four features of collective conscience prevalence of a strong sense of collective conscience and in such societies collective conscience the sum total of all these beliefs and value systems that are shared by people would be very very strong and all four variables of collective conscience are very strong here the collective, the cultural system is very high in volume. Okay, that the, the, the group members of that particular society, if you are taking the example of a tribal society, they will, they will adhere by the given uh, collective conscience. The rules and regulations will be, will be, will, uh, you know, that will govern their uh, thinking, their actions, their everyday life, their outlook, their tastes, their opinion. Everything will be uh, kind of. Uh, completely even determined, influenced by their collective conscience, its intensity, okay, everybody obeys that, nobody can even think of going, uh, you know, against that, of course, people people might try, but then they will have to pay a huge price for that, okay, so this intensity is very high, determinateness, to, to what extent it, it has clarity in terms of the rules, okay, can you, can you, can you uh, move away from that, or can you amend that, can you dilute that, these possibilities are very less and it would be very high in terms of religious content. The, the, uh, the way in which uh, it, is, it is explained, they invoke all kind of theological or, or magical or supernatural uh, ideas and these ideas will, will, will legitimize this particular uh, social systems. Then, what happens when people move away from or people violate this collective conscience? Deviation from the dictates of this collective conscience is viewed as a crime against all members of the society and goals. So any violation will be seen as a crime against all members of the society and also of the god because it is very high in terms of the religious content. If they, uh, you know, if, if, if they do something, some, something that is not acceptable to that particular group, it will not be tolerated. And so in that sense, the idea of individual freedom, choice and autonomy are low in mechanical societies. Okay. So in such societies, the idea of individual freedom, the argument that I, I, I am an, I'm an uh, independent individual, I can do whatever I want, this uh, argument simply does not exist. And ideas about choice, about uh, agency, autonomy, these things are low in mechanical societies. You know that is creating an ideal type. Uh, you know, uh, a, a kind of an ideal typical description, but uh, it's important. And in contrast, organically structured societies, organically structured societies in the sense, societies which have grown much larger, which has more differentiated parts, which are more complicated, and uh, the, the, the ideal typical example would be that of an industrial urban uh, society. They are uh, typified by a large population distributed in specialized dis, uh, distributed in specialized roles in many diverse structural units okay. in a uh, you know advanced society you will find the division of labor is much higher there are people working in different uh, 
designated roles, different uh, extremely uh, you know specialized areas are there, and organic societies reveal high degree of interdependence among individuals and corporate units with exchange, legal contracts, and norms regulating these interrelations. And you know that in in, in modern societies, uh, not everybody uh, is involved in in production of food. Very few uh, people uh, engage in the production of, of of food or in agriculture. Another section of people they specialize as educators. Another set of people they educate they they, they specialize as as lawyers or that of medical practitioners or accountants or computer uh, analysts. So each of these section, because they specialize to a high, to a very high degree, are also dependent upon others. And this is in a stark contrast with that of a primitive society where the division of labor is very low and because the division of labor is so low that people are more independent. Because you are the, 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 the realm of your possible activities are very, very uh, less so that you can do whatever you want or you can do almost every important, uh, very basic necessary functions uh, for, for your survival. Whereas in a advanced societies, you are highly specialized and the more you specialize, the more dependent you are on others. And this dependency creates a system of interdependence among others, which is uh, ruled by exchange legal contracts and norms regulating these interrelations. And in modern industry societies, where individuals are dispersed throughout a highly diversified occupation system, people differences stand out more than their resemblance. So in such societies, such uh, industrial advanced societies, people are very different. And these differences of the people in terms of their thinking, in terms of their uh, you know ideas, in terms of their orientations, in terms of their ideological leanings, their personal preferences, they would be they would be enormously diverse. Okay, you will see a, a plethora of opinion. For example, the whole question whether uh, God exists or whether do you believe in God. This question simply does not exist in in many of the tribal societies. They may not even ask this question. Whereas in a modern society, you have so much of there's a spectrum of you know positions that you can adopt from that of a you know committed uh, believer to that of a completely committed atheist uh, to a, uh, people who have different uh, shades of spirituality, uh, agnostics, a host of other ideas, or even this whole idea of sexuality. This idea of sexuality is completely different in modern societies compared to that of a primitive society. Or how to lead a, a, a family life, whether you can you can you can live together. This whole idea of living together is, is something unheard of, or uh, in, in in a primitive society. So each and every uh, aspect of human activity becomes more complicated in a uh, modern society. An average individual is exposed to so many different ways of doing the same thing, and he or she is bombarded with options. That, that exposure, that level of exposure, exposure is something mind-blowing, which does not exist in a traditional society. Now, collective conscience becomes low in its volume, intensity, determinateness, and more in secular content than that of religion. So, uh, this is something very important because here, uh, the claim also is uh, indirectly hinting at what uh, uh, Weber uh, talks about uh, later when he talks about secularization as a process where society gradually moves out of its religious influence. So most of these uh, activities that human beings do in a modern society are mostly bereft of its religious content. They don't attribute anything to the supernatural. They don't uh, attribute anything to kind of theological uh, propositions. Rather, they argue it on the basis of secular ideas, more rational, modern, secular ideas. Again, um, I must caution you that these are ideal typical representations and empirical analysis might be different. So this collective conscience, the collective conscience becomes enfeebled and more abstract providing highly general and secular value premises for the exchanges, contracts and norms regulating the interdependencies among specialized social units. So because there is so much of diversity in this modern societies, this collective consciousness becomes more feeble. It becomes it, it becomes less powerful. They, it becomes enfeebled and more abstract. It loses its 
contract it loses its concrete character it becomes vague it becomes less powerful and providing highly general and secular value premises for the exchange contracts and norms regulating the interdependencies among the specialized social units in such societies individual freedom is great and and the king is a champion of of individualism he says that individual is a new god he declared the demise of god he argued that individual is a new god modern societies in modern societies individualism is a sacred thing that's it's a very fascinating argument we will discuss when we uh, come to this uh, his the king in the king's argument about uh, religion and the secular and highly abstract collective conscience become dominated by values stressing respect for personal dignity of the individual so the person because the, the idea of human rights individual rights right to life right to dignity okay these becomes important uh, catchword these becomes important uh, uh, you know slogans in a modern society and considerably divergent views influenced by different ideologies and moral positions almost on everything that's what i just explained everything how to rear your children how to give them education whether you need to send them to the school or you can give them education through home home schooling or you you know so each and everything that we otherwise would have taken for granted that we would have done mechanically now becomes a problematic uh, proposition or who does what at, 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 in in your house as a, as a, as a, as a male or as a female what are the things that you are supposed to do and this division of the gender division of labor was never a major concern in traditional societies there were more or less clear cut gender roles assigned women would cook men would go out or do agricultural labor labor but here in a modern society these expectations or these normative propositions have become more and more complicated so a fundamental relationship a fundamental relationship in the social world among the structural differentiation value generalization and normative specification takes place a fundamental relationship in social world among the structural differentiation so there is a uh, this structural differentiation becomes more and more acute then values become more and more general and the normative specification becomes more and more weak as societies differentiate structurally in the sense as societies develop society increases in terms of its uh, uh, specialization values become more abstract the collective conscience changes its nature as societies become more voluminous when society become too big to broad the intensity of of their shared you know set of values becomes much much lower that intensity decreases because these societies are spread over vast surface the common conscience or culture rises above local diversities and consequently becomes more abstract and this is very different when you compare a a large society spread across huge geographic area with that of a more localized uh, community traditional community where this commitment to this uh, feelings commitment to their identity commitment to their uh, firm beliefs will be much more strong so this he argues has enormous implication on a host of of other institutions including that of religion including law including education and the post of power which we will discuss in the coming class so uh, in today's class we had a uh, we we uh, began uh, discussing his major work the division of labor where he brings in this this he tries to answer this whole question how does a society is possible how is a society possible how does a society work what is the connection between an individual and the society and he also wants to bring in a theorization about the society the transformation of society or social change from a traditional society to that of a modern society and that he explains by bringing in two two important aspects one is that of collective conscience and the other one is that of social structure and he argues that when the social structure becomes more and more differentiates then there's a corresponding change that happens in the social consciousness and that he explains on the basis of this transition from societies characterized by mechanical solidarity to that of societies characterized by collective uh, sorry societies characterized by organic solidarity okay 
so we are uh, this uh, class uh, we are winding up now and the next class also will be a continuation of the same discussion of the division of labor because it's an extensive work thank you